Good afternoon and also good morning to some. Welcome friends and colleagues to the ASPA Flex 4 webinar, Learning Airway Through Simulation. My name is uh, Josephine. I'm a pediatric anesthetist from KK Children, Women and Children's Hospital in Singapore. And together with my colleague, Dr. Satish, we will be the moderators for today's session. We have an interesting one hour program lined up for you today, but before we start, I would like to make some housekeeping announcements. Questions and comments can be posted in the Q&A section at any time of the webinar. Answers will be provided by the speakers at the end of the webinar or will be posted as replies in the Q&A section. Please do not use the raise hand or chat function. The webinar will be recorded and can be viewed after the session via our website, Facebook or YouTube. Certificate of attendance will be automatically generated and forwarded to those who have completed and submitted the post webinar survey. Thank you for your attention. Let us start the webinar. For a long time, learning airway, like everything else in medicine, has always been an apprenticeship. See one, do one, and teach one. And the doctor's skills are largely honed on life's patients. Today, training methods try to provide doctors the opportunity to practice even before we approach the patient. Let me now invite our first speaker, Dr. Teddy Fabila, to tell us if and how airway simulation can translate to better clinical practice. Teddy is a senior anesthetist with the Department of Pediatric Anesthesia in KK Women and Children's Hospital in Singapore. He is the faculty at our yearly pediatric airway workshop in Singapore and has lots of experience making airway training models. Dr. Teddy, please proceed with your talk. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Joe, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for spending another Sunday with us. Before I start, I want to highlight that there is no conflict of interest nor paid sponsorship for this talk. Although I will be mentioning some simulator brands later, mainly for educational purposes. Let us begin. The increasing favor for simulation-based learning has been greatly pushed by decreased acceptance of practicing medical skills on patients, advances in simulation technology, as well as flourishing culture of safety. Simulation-based learning prepare us healthcare providers by building the knowledge, skill, and confidence needed to face critical events such as difficult airway, even before we experience a scenario. This afternoon, my task is to discuss technical and non-technical airway management, simulator-based training, and how can this prepare us for medical realities. In the interest of time for the discussion of learning technical skill in airway management, I will be focusing mainly on hardware-based simulators and virtual reality. Hardware-based simulators can be further classified to device, patient, and environment-based. Device-based simulators set a target skill that a trainee must attain at the end of the session. It can range from low cost to high fidelity equipments. For example, in setting up simulators for front of the neck axis like scalpel bougie or needle cricotyrototomy as seen in this video, Trachea model can be made from materials such as anesthesia circuits, orthopedic casts, with or without synthetic leather or skin. Another option is to use a 3D printed larynx and trachea model for more realistic anatomic landmark during training, or a medium fidelity model equipped with face, skin, and lungs. Learning bronchoscopy maneuvers could be challenging as simulators can be expensive and not readily available. In our center, we have a low cost trachea bronchi model made from anesthesia circuit and clean antibiotic bottles. At the end of every antibiotic bottles are flags of different countries. The goal of this simulator is for participants to search as many flags as he can. From this activity, he will be trained of proper bronchoscopy handling 
and maneuvers. Alternatively, we also have a 3D printed seven-year-old trachea bronchi model, giving a more realistic feel relative to pediatric size ratio. During the pediatric airway and ventilation workshop in Singapore, attendees were given a chance to learn bronchoscopy maneuvers with live anesthetized animal model, an experience closest to pediatric airway. Patient-based simulators can be responsive to physiologic process or anatomic airway difficulty. One example is ORSIM, which exhibit physiologic responses to airway manipulation. Their software can simulate difficult airway scenarios equipped with realistic pre-programmed responses if the patient is light from anesthesia, having secretion issues, and local anesthetic topicalization requirement, to name a few. High fidelity simulator models can be script controlled and elicit on command physiologic responses like tongue swelling in this video. Other models can also provide you with laryngo and bronchospasm. The experience with specific anatomic airway deformity can be rare for some anesthesiologists, particularly those under training. Therefore, simulators such as this Pierre-Robin difficult airway model provides the airway management hands-on training to clinicians who haven't encountered such case. Environment-based simulators does not only ch challenge participants' ability, it is also a test for the facility's capacity to handle the case, adequacy of space, and resources available. Various studies indicate that learning can be better applied or recalled when the context and the learning environment resemble the retrieval environment. Some simulation exercise will even be conducted in an actual operating theater. This insight to training equipped with anesthesia machine, OT bed, lighting and airway equipments allow participants to experience a scenario in the most realistic environment. Face-to-face -face exercises are gravely affected by the current COVID-19 pandemic situation. The move to online teaching has limited procedural hands-on teaching, such as difficult airway management. Virtual reality posed as one of the solutions for this dilemma, as it can simulate the physical environment through a special, specialized equipment, like headsets and haptic devices, which provide physical feedback to the users. The augmented reality for airway simulation exhibits more complex tests of psychomotor skill. In one exercise, the software can be equipped to cover device, patient, and environment-based simulators. If installed in a training lab, a trainee can undergo simulation-based exercise, even without the mentor's physical presence, followed by an online, maybe a Zoom meeting for evaluation and debriefing. My course speakers this afternoon will provide us more details regarding virtual reality. Please stay tuned for that. Learning all this airway management technical skills is important, but it's also essential to learn the when and how to use it. Non-technical skills is a combination of cognitive, social, and personal resource, resource skills that complement technical skills and contribute to safe and efficient task performance. The concept was derived from European, European civil aviation from where Fletcher et al. patterned and designed the anesthetist non-technical skills system with four main categories. While leadership covers all categories, the main four includes task management, teamwork and communication, situation awareness, and decision making. Planning is essential during preparation for a difficult airway case. You must know your institution resources so that you can prioritize intervention according to your available airway equipment and experienced health care provider. Rules and responsibilities of team members must be defined before the patient comes. All escalation plan must be discussed during team huddle prior to patient's arrival. The team leader is the main voice for instructions during difficult airway event. However, members are encouraged to speak up for safety 
and voiced out concerns as needed. Situation awareness is about gathering and processing information from a difficult airway scenario and using stored memories of events and mental models to make sense of it. It allows team leaders to anticipate the next step and be able to respond to individual cues without confirmation. Dynamic decision-making is a continuous cycle of monitoring and re-evaluation of difficult airway scenario and then making the safe, appropriate intervention. Decision-making can vary from conditions such as time pressure, task demands, feasibility option, and what level of constraint, support, and resource present during the difficult airway. From here, we can say that both simulation-based technical and non-technical skills aim to prepare us to actual medical scenarios. There are numerous publications suggested various means to support this claim. However, for this talk, I will be highlighting suggestions relative to anesthetist level of experience. The three includes integration of simulation and residency training, eliminating latent errors in practice and false confidence, and maintenance and perfection of skills. Inclusion of simulation training in residency will give a novice resident a realistic experience while not putting a patient at risk. Trainees will be able to learn both technical and non-technical airway management under a predictable, programmable, standardizable, reproducible airway scenarios. This can be used to repeated assessment and help practice rare clinical cases. Bloom et al. study highlighted that simulation assessment can be benchmarked according to trainees' level of experience. Other studies show promising results that simulation test customization according to different year level of trainees and determine if they can be promoted based from their performance. Prompt feedback and structured debriefing of procedure-specific simulation training resulted in subsequent improved performance of trainees. Apart from this, this improved performance can also be due to trainees' detailed and close to reality experience during simulators. Some institutions will even create and fund for a simulation center dedicated in perfecting near reality simulation. However, if faced with resources issue, creative low cost simulators can be designed with realistic impact to residents as we have discussed earlier. Simulation-based session can increase trainees' confidence and perceived abilities. This can pose potential dangers when a resident develops false sense of security to manage a difficult airway. Training and evaluation, training and evaluation must not end with one simulation-based exercise. There must be a regular check of trainees' performance to ensure correct knowledge has passed on so that his practice will not cause harm to actual patient. This is supported by Kudavali et al, where they showed improved ability of residents. Prime with simulator technology in handling cannot intubate and cannot oxygenate scenarios and recommended repeated tests every six months or less. One suggested technique is to conduct an observed simulation on non-critical actual cases. This may bring about latent errors that a resident makes while handling routine cases. An official residence in Singapore and Philippines are required to complete and pass mini CEX and DOPS on airway management. Mentors will feedback and correct misconceptions and unsafe practices as early as tr anesthesia training level. So that when faced with difficult airway, a resident in his senior level can perform safe management with minimal or even without direct supervision from consultants. Consultants are experienced with both technical and non-technical skills. However, they need to ensure that they are maintaining developed skill or even perfecting proper hand-eye coordination when handling airway equipment. In-service hands-on teaching must be scheduled for every new airway equipment procured and in the department. All staff members must be familiar and confident in handling airway equipments. To avoid knowledge gap, 
du during actual airway emergencies. This is further supported by JCI standard under staff qualification and education at number eight, where it states that each staff member must receive in-service and other education and training to maintain or to advance his or her skills and knowledge. <clears throat> In KK Pediatric Anesthesia, Dr. Joe, our maintenance of skill B, organizes yearly session for all skill set relevant to critical events, including difficult area management. The training gives us confidence and preparedness in handling difficult airway cases and be mindful with the resources available during such events. Furthermore, in known difficult airway case, the team can even organize a simulation exercise with all healthcare providers involved during the actual events. This particular exercise will not only test the equipments that we are going to use, but also to make clear a provider's role, escalation plan, and crowd control. In summary, learning area management to hardware-based simulators provide technical skill essential to be confident and knowledgeable in handling specific airway equipment or executing a specific difficult airway intervention. Non-technical skills simulation answers the when and how to use a learned technical skill. It teaches to plan and prepare efficiently anticipate the next step based from the flow of events, provide prompt decision-making, and perform with clear communication and good teamwork. Healthcare providers can be prepared to an actual difficult airway case by integration of simulation and precedency training, capturing and eliminating latent errors and practice and false confidence at training level. Lastly, maintenance and perfection of an expert level skills. Thank you and good afternoon again. Thank you, Teddy, for your talk. Uh, COVID has put a stop to face-to-face -to -face learning, especially it includes simulation, but obviously training has to go on. So can virtual reality trainers, uh, which are akin to video games, can they add on and maybe someday even replace every learning experience through simulation? To answer that, uh, let me invite our second speaker, uh, Mr. Robert Naninga. Mr. Naninga is an experienced entrepreneur with focus on, but definitely not limited to medtech, healthcare, and IT. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Virtual Med School. It's an international medical education platform of choice uh, for online learning solutions with a strong focus on something which you learn, which is called serious gaming and uh, highly complex medical education. Uh, their fact, flagship product, which you know about now is, uh, is it is called ABCDE Sim. And it's equivalent to a flight simulator for medical professionals. Mr. Naninga, uh, please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Noninga, as mentioned, and I will be talking about ABCD eSIM. It's my pleasure to uh, talk to you. I'm speaking from the Netherlands, so in my case is still in the morning. Um, these are the topics I would like to talk to you about. Um, first introduction about myself, then I will get into the concepts of gaming, tell you a little bit about what is the aim of gaming is and where, where Aiming actually uh, is helping us uh, to change behavior. Then I will go into ABCD eSIM and I will conclude some lessons learned among the last years when we uh, implemented ABCD eSIM internationally. As mentioned, I am an entrepreneur in digital health, uh, co founder of Virtual Med School. And as a disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor nor a nurse. So in the course of the presentation, if I say something that is medically not correct, Please, uh, uh, um, I apologize. Um, uh, I have a lot of doctors and nurses around me to provide these input. Uh, uh, so, but I'm an entrepreneur uh, with a business administration background. Uh, gaming, um, gaming is all about influencing behavior. 
on this slide you will see uh, 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 something that you will likely have in your environment as well. It makes a picture of you when you are speeding and you get a penalty sent home. So it actually tries to uh, uh, change your behavior, but usually you don't, you don't see them and you only notice afterwards when you get the penalty uh, sent home. So it's not a very efficient way of influencing behavior. Uh, then there's also some signs saying, okay, you're speeding. If you don't, if you don't stop speeding, you might get a fine. And this is more uh, changing your behavior, but not very effective. Of course, actually this leads to people uh, uh, introducing game uh, attributes in this. This is a high score sign where everyone, apparently there was no ticket afterwards, it was uh, uh, writing down his high score when passing this sign. Well, that's actually stimulating false behavior instead of uh, uh, changing behavior in a positive way. And then this is an experience uh, that has in Nordic uh, uh, countries in Europe. They actually had a, a sign saying uh, what your speed was. And if you were speeding, you would get a fine. Uh, and then they had uh, they, they would register your, your 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 plate number, and amongst the people that were not speeding, uh, there was a lottery uh, which was paid by the people who actually were getting a fine. Now now we're getting into gaming because now you can choose either to speed or not to speed. Or do you want to go for the bonus, or uh, 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 are you not uh, competing and just uh, going on what you're doing? But this is actually changing behavior in a positive way. Well, this is something you might see as well, uh, a litter. Uh, what do you do about litter? Well, it's very easy. You can make a cookie monster out of a litter can. Uh, this is a, a, a doing the positive approach. Um, this is uh, something from my youth. This is a, a fairy tale park in the Netherlands where there's a big guy uh, dressed in red actually is calling you out saying, uh, feed me, feed me, feed me. And the children are supposed to put all the litter in his mouth so there's no litter lying around. You have to keep in mind when they started this, the area was green. There was lots of bushes and trees around this guy. Uh, but the children were so enthusiastic about uh, feeding uh, uh, hollebolle guys that they actually broke down all the, the, the branches. And now there's, there's no, no tree left, uh, basically. So this is where gaming goes wrong because people go overboard on uh, achieving goals and damaging uh, uh, other things. This is, this is about the where you put your uh, the letter. If you make a maze, people might be inclined to uh, search for the most optimal way to go there and end up at the letter case. But you can also make it uh, 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 ask a question and then people who are uh, maybe in favor of Messi or Ronaldo will make an effort to change the behavior, making a point that they like the one more than the other. But this is all about behavior and uh, how do you change behavior in a way that people are not uh, uh, actually always aware that they are uh, 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 tricked into, uh, into doing this. So the, which leads me to the question, what is a serious game? A serious game is a combination of a game and a learning objective. Um, and there are specific characteristics to this. It should have a challenging goal, an assignment. And the assignment should be linked to a learning objective. Uh, in addition, uh, you need to have interaction with the player and the player should to play a role in achieving the game's goal. So that he should be active while achieving his learning objective. ABCDE thing is something we de developed five, six years ago. And this actually was an idea of Dr. Stephanie klein nagevoort my colleague, who then as a young doctor in the emergency ward thought, well, I know I am uh, practiced, I know what to do, but why can I not use my spare time uh, exercising complex uh, scenarios uh, on my own, uh, so I know that when, when something happens, I know what to do. And, and this is something that's very similar, uh, uh, very uh, uh, much used in the aviation industry, where a pilot has to go through testing every year, and there's a lot of simulations uh, uh, proving that he's actually uh, still uh, uh, up to standard. But in the health industry and in, in hospitals, this is not so much a case. There are a lot of uh, practices, but usually those are crew practices where you need a mannequin. And there was a need for to develop a solution where you actually could, in your own time, in your private environment, in a safe environment, practice and improve your skills. Uh, well, what's the bigger problem that lies behind this? Well, we are facing an aging population, so we need more people on the bedside. Uh, and uh, we need more doctors and nurses, which are difficult to find. And uh, in reality, what we have been done over the last years, we were making experienced doctors trainers. and. Uh, we can all conclude that not all excellent doctors are excellent trainers. Uh, so basically, 
uh, uh, education doesn't scale. Want if you need more trainers to train more people, uh, and uh, and there are no trainers, then basically we are running behind. So using uh, serious gaming can be a solution for that. Then also looking into the figures, uh, the third cause of death in the US after heart disease and cancer is uh, an error uh, that may not be on purpose, but the, the, actually the third cause of uh, death. I'm always just using this example as an example from the US, so it is safe, but even in, in Europe, uh, I'm no doubt the, the figures are not anything different. Uh, and then uh, by using simulation, actually uh, improving quality of patient care and uh, providing a safe environment, we can re reduce also malpractice suits and actually uh, have shorter hospital stays just by increasing quality in, in, uh, in our healthcare system. So what we did, we created ABCDE SIM. You might wonder uh, why we use this name, uh, but ABCDE is uh, derived from the uh, ABCDE methods. It's called airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. And this is an uh, international standard that's used in acute medicine to assess and stabilize patients. Um, in this case, you have to follow the, uh, the ABCDE. And then if, you, if you're correct, uh, actually, uh, you will find out what's wrong with the patient and you can uh, actually uh, uh, bring it to the right specialty to do follow-up treatment. In the A on airway, I will go to more into detail later on. Just a little bit about ABCDE SIM. Uh, we did work this, developed this together with uh, Erasmus Medical Center, which is the largest academic center in the Netherlands. And uh, we also used uh, the, 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 the training for uh, GPs in the, in the Netherlands um, and the University of Twente who helped us on the technical parts on, uh, on this game. Um, what's different from a game and ABCDE sim? Actually, it's a crossover between a serious game and a medical simulation, meaning at the background, we run a virtual patient model, which simulates uh, the behavior of the patient. Uh, so in the case of patients that have a blood st uh, uh, stomach bleeding, the um, heartbeat would go up and the blood pressure would go down. And if you don't treat the patient uh, uh, straight on by the right medication, it will have a different effect on the physiological performance of the page, patient than when you actually uh, do that after 10 minutes. So therefore, uh, the patient will respond in a real life-like situation, and there's no easy way out uh, like a maze. Most games actually uh, have a, a, a tree, a decision tree, and if you follow the decision tree and you remember the decision tree, you will always get to the end. In our case, if you say, well, you know, A, B, C, D, E, uh, I know better, you have to do it the other way around, you're, you're free to start with the E and work your way up to the A, but you will notice that uh, that will not be of benefit to uh, the patient. So what does it look like? This is uh, actually uh, uh, um, the main screen from the, uh, the, the first game that we created, which was for uh, doctors and nurses in the hospital. But we also did versions for GPs, severe trainment and one for pediatrics. And I will go into that uh, later on. You will recognize a similarity in the screens. This is the GP version where there's a more simple equipment available, more GP style uh, 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 practice uh, uh, um, uh, room. Um, and um, in this case, it's a severe uh, burden. We actually had to change, change the physiological model to fit uh, uh, liquid management, which is associated with uh, uh, the treatment of uh, uh, severe burns. And for the pediatric version, uh, we had to change the physiological model actually to fit the, the, the um, physiological working of, of small children. Uh, and in this case, uh, it was a very, very small child. In this screen, you will see on the right, you will see the trolley with the A, B, C, D, and E. I'll, I will show you more in the, in the movie. You can talk to your assistant above uh, and actually uh, ask her uh, to do stuff. And you can actually have, you have a, a monitor, uh, which gives a real life feedback from the physiological model. And below, there is, you can uh, uh, take equipment, you can listen to the patient, you can uh, see the, the patient, and you can touch the patient. And here you can interact with your environment. So let me show you a small movie about uh, ABCD, eSIM. There's no um, audio connected, so I will do the talking. So I will ask this nurse to... Uh, I will ask the nurse to uh, uh, put the monitor on, which will take 45 uh, seconds. Meanwhile, she cannot do anything else. So, uh, so I will listen to the, the patient. There are actually sounds uh, uh, when you do this. 
uh, which are connected to the, the case. And then um, uh, you so have first instinct, then I can check the eye inspection. You see the pupil reflex, which is left and right is similar. Then I will check the airway. And in this case, it's very simple. The airway is not blocked, so it's open. So I can continue to do so. Then I have the cabinet, we have different equipment. Um, I'll show you a little bit on the B, there's a, on breathing, a lot of uh, equipment. And on the C, there are the catheters. And on the D, there is uh, just a point of care glucose matter, and then an E is uh, a blanket and uh, temperature. Also have medication that I can, uh, and then the, the patient will respond on the medication uh, 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 through the physiological model. So if you overdose, you actually uh, notice the effects on the, on the patient. We go to the A, for example, let's try this, but then I'm not allowed to do in incubate, so I have to ask someone else, uh, but I can try to do a Mayo tube. Now I take one, uh, and in this case, oh, that goes wrong, I, I was not, shouldn't put such a large Mayo tube in the patient. So now I have to check again, and I have to check the airway, and what I see, there's a lot of vomit uh, around there, so I can... And if, if, if the vomit stays in, you will see that uh, uh, the oxygen levels will go down at the, at the, in, in the patient. So in this case, uh, we did uh, okay. This is the end of the movie. You can go, there's a lot of functionality as well, but for the sake of time, I only uh, did this one. Um, yeah. So in gaming, what's important uh, when you, when you uh, uh, implement gaming, you need to have a clear goal and strategy. But also you need to have a choice uh, uh, to uh, make a choice that is not correct and then get feedback on that and we and make another choice. So you could have to, have to need an environment where you can actually apply strategies on your patient and see what the effect is on the, on the patient in a very safe way. And so you, the freedom to fail is extremely important. And also that's why if you play it by yourself, there's no one looking over your shoulder and you are free to fail because uh, you have no, uh, no one else uh, having an opinion on that. Uh, you just uh, uh, educate yourself in your own time. Uh, by using ABCD SIM at the Russell Medical Center, we, are, uh, we reduce 50% of the cost of, of training because we, we moved uh, class, uh, classical training uh, to online training. And then uh, after that, we actually had a, a PhD student doing a thesis on this. Um, and we found out that it was also more effective uh, to, uh, to play. Because after playing ABCD SIM, people still go into the simulation center. They still uh, uh, practice on uh, on the manic, eh? but they were just better equipped to do so because they didn't have to think about what the A, the B, and C, the E was. And they could more focus on the CRM part of the training. Um, we are using this in the Netherlands, but also uh, in the UK. And actually in the UK, I'm very proud to tell you that we actually run uh, through the uh, Royal College of Physicians on a lot of uh, locations, and uh, they use ABCD ESIM to train residents uh, as a preparation for the simulation uh, center training. Uh, which is doing uh, quite quite well. Um, well, what are lessons learned while while uh, uh, playing uh, and creating ABCD sim? F first point, you need to know what your learning objective is. I get a lot of questions from people who actually want to create a serious game, and we first have a discussion: what is your objective? And it may not always be the case that a serious game is the right means to the ends that you're trying to achieve. So, but if you cannot even define your learning objective very clearly, you also cannot define which means you should use actually to, to get to the learning objective. And sometimes VR might be appropriate, and sometimes an app on a, on a, on a phone might be appropriate, and sometimes a PowerPoint is, is even appropriate. So that's something that you really have to balance. Then in your point, what you see is technology, we can do a lot of things with the technology, but if you don't have your content partners, meaning you, the people in the audience, the audience uh, the doctors and nurses who are experienced in their field will try to uh, bring this over to, to their colleagues. Uh, yeah, there's no point in, in, in doing this. I see a lot of uh, technology smart solutions that actually have no content uh, uh, partners uh, uh, on board. And even if we get questions about our content, I always pass this on to the doctors and nurses I work with because uh, the, 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 the reality is that uh, they know better uh, how to do this. Uh, 
Then what I see as third point, I see a lot of uh, people spending money on uh, uh, creating a game for their own personal hospital, usually as part of the PhD thesis. And then later on, it, 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 it's not being used and it's not being used in other centers as well. And if there's uh, after half a year, the content needs to be updated, there's no one around. And if you can't start a game, there's no one you can call. So you have to keep in mind that uh, the cost of uh, success uh, is more than just the money that you pay to, to create a game. Uh, in order to make it a success, you need to really embed it in your organization and have people available that actually can provide the support and actually can make the changes. And if there's a, a, a something changing in the, in the ruling, you have to actually update your game as well. And the last point, actually, who's paying for this? Uh, uh, in Europe, we have a discussion of the Netherlands that the insurance company should pay for it. Who is then saying, well, we're not going to pay for it. So hospitals are uh, paying for it. Uh, on behalf of their uh, students. But it also I see students actually paying it for themselves because they want to improve themselves or increase their chances of getting into an, a new job. Um, what we are working on at the moment is actually we are setting up a TAP uh, platform in Singapore in combination with Serious Games Asia, where, where we are uh, using um, uh, games that developed for Sing Health uh, uh, to put them on the platforms to make them available for everyone uh, in uh, in Singapore and also the, uh, the, in the area around Singapore. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, uh, it will be uh, uh, also an environment where you can actually, if you have a question on developing uh, a game, feel free to contact us and we might be able uh, to help you set up uh, uh, with a project. Before I conclude my presentation, um, if you are interested in playing ABCD Eastern, we have a free level which is actually built on the COVID-19 level. Uh, and if you follow the URL that's in the, on the slide, you can uh, uh, fill in a form and you get uh, uh, access to our system and you can play the, the free level. Uh, so once I have to get a feel on what ABCD system is, I was only able to show you a small portion of the functionality. But the other side also uh, yeah, to educate yourself in uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, using uh, 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 simulation and also uh, using this on COVID-19. This concludes my presentation. If you have any questions uh, through the organization, you will also get my contacts, but if you want to contact me, uh, this is my uh, email address. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Naninga, for your talk. Um, the question of whether seeing virtually without touch is enough to attain proficiency for airway skills may be on some people's minds. Prof Bello, our third speaker, will now give us some idea how virtual reality simulators with kinesthetic or haptic feedback may be important for virtual procedural training. Prof Fernando Bello obtained his PhD in biomedical systems from the Imperial College London. Since 2019, he joined Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore as Professor and Associate Dean in the Department of Technology, Enhanced Learning and Innovation. Prof Bello is particularly interested in the use of virtual and mixed reality environments and haptics in the context of education and training. Prof Bello, please proceed. Many thanks, Dr. Cho. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks again. Uh, delighted to be here at this uh, ASPA webinar. Uh, I want to thank my previous speakers, um, Teddy and Ronald. Um, thank you very much for a very good introduction to both simulation, uh, virtual reality simulation, as well as serious gaming. Uh, I'm going to concentrate in the next 20 or so minutes in terms of uh, the sense of touch. Um, this is a brief outline of my presentation. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction to, uh, about myself, followed by uh, definition of haptics, looking at haptic interfaces, haptics enable simulators, uh, conclusions, and possible future. Um, I, my background is in computer science and engineering. Uh, I did a, a BSc in electronic systems engineering a little while ago, followed by a PhD that uh, Dr. John mentioned. Uh, and then uh, as a professor of surgical computing and simulation science at Imperial College London, 
and since last year at Duke and US as Professor of Technology, Hands Learning and Innovation. Um, previously work at Imperial College London, we developed a series of haptically enabled simulators around different specialties such as endoscopy, orthopedics, um, interventional radiology, but also surgery and uh, pediatric laparoscopy. At Duke and US, we're focusing on three key areas. Uh, one of them is around immersive learning. Uh, the second one is digital printing. And the third one is artificial intelligence and learning analytics. These are not discrete areas. They overlap between the three of them. And we want to do this, explore these areas in order to enhance the Emory curriculum, but also working closely with our colleagues at uh, Sync Health as part of the uh, academic medical center between Duke and US and Sync Health. Moving on to haptics, um, we'll start by defining haptics. Haptics refers to the sense of touch, uh, but it's more than just touch, it's about active touch. It's the idea of when you push on the wall, the wall pushes back. So there is any action that you take, there will be a reaction, there will be a feeling that you get as you, uh, for example, palpate a patient or as you press down on a surface. Haptics is how we learn about the world around us through the sense of touch. The sense of touch is sometimes known as a forgotten sense. We usually don't really notice the sense of touch, although it's really crucial to our daily living. And touch comes from a continuous sense. So this is where we have a series of small receptors that detect various characteristics of touch, pressure, vibration, and temperature. There's also a kinesthetic sense that is to do with proprioception in the muscles and joints and allows us to detect the position of our limbs and larger forces acting on them. And finally, we have the vestibular component, which is the fluid in the inner ear that will measure the acceleration forces acting on the whole of the body. And all of this together, all of these three together combine to form the sense of touch. We'll come back to this later on when talking about haptic interfaces. One thing that is quite um, important is that um, we can actually see with touch. Uh, and this is um, uh, surprisingly a few, very few, six is more specifically, different exploratory procedures that, that have been studied and that they allow us to explore objects through the sense of touch. I've um, shown those here is lateral motion, you can see it to detect the texture, uh, pressure to detect the hardness, static contact to detect the temperature, uh, then unsupported holding to get a sense of the weight, enclosure and contour following to get a sense of the global shape and the more detailed shape. Uh, now, this is relevant because the best haptic interfaces will then aim to allow the same kind of interactions in virtual reality as in real life. This is illustrating it's, it's a simulated uh, operation, but it's illustrating how the sense of touch, the interaction between the surgeon, and you can see at the back the anesthetist, you can see all the, the team, how touch is really crucial, not just in surgery, but across medicine, across healthcare. But it's not just about the, uh, the gross sense of touch, it's also the, uh, the more fine tactile interaction and, and the affective component of touch as well that are relevant to medicine, surgery and healthcare. So how can we recreate this sense of touch? There is a series of haptic interfaces or haptic devices that you can imagine, you can see them as uh, the um, equivalent of computer monitor, but for the sense of touch. So whereas a computer monitor will display and, and show to your um, eyesight the different characteristics of interaction or a model, the um, haptic interfaces will create the illusion of touching something which does not actually exist in real life. A haptic device therefore provides feedback through your uh, receptors in the fingers or throughout your body to recreate that sense of touch. You can see a few examples of this type of devices uh, shown on the screen. A haptic interface is good enough when the user no longer feels the device, only the sensation itself. So 
It's the whole idea of being able to recreate that interaction, that sense of touch, but without interfering with it. Let's look at uh, the first type of haptic interfaces, those that are able to recreate tactile sensations. And this is related to temperature, vibration, skin deformation. Um, the most widely used devices for generating this type of haptic feedback um, are known as vibrotactile actuators. And they range from very simple, such as those in mobile phones. We've got the, the latest phones here, Illustrator, that, as you know, not just vibrate, but in fact, in quite a few different apps, they generate very detailed uh, viral tactile sensations. Uh, and there's also uh, different uh, gloves that can have multiple embedded vibrating units. This is another example. This is um, quite a while ago, back in the uh, probably late 90s, this IFIL mouse that uh, incorporated viral tactile actuator and this was able to therefore generate this uh, sensation and generate a degree of tactile feedback on, on the mouse. Um, you can also see here a, um, a, a glove, cyber touch glove. Again, um, this was one of the first gloves that, uh, that came to the market and that, that had six individually controlled vibrotactile tactile actuators for each of the fingers and for, for the palm of the hand. More recently, uh, tactile interfaces have been developed to generate um, a, a better quality feedback. And this is looking at an array of pins, uh, such as those illustrated here, that uh, are able to uh, generate uh, feedback in, um, in very, very accurate, uh, very small uh, resolution, um, and, and also looking at uh, quite a high frequency above 300 hertz. Uh, there's different um, technologies that are used for this. Uh, this is still pretty much in, in the lab, but uh, increasingly it's been incorporated into the latest haptic interfaces. Now, the second type of uh, haptic interfaces are those that generate force feedback. So this is more related to the kinesthetic proprioceptive sense. Uh, and they can be conceived as uh, small robots, small robots that um, typically will have some weight or will have some sort of attachment that uh, grounds them. So this is in order to be able to generate that force feedback on the, um, on the individual. Some example of this type of um, um, force feedback devices, you can see them here, these are um, commercially available, although some of them, such as one here in the middle is no longer available, but most of the others are available. And you can see that there is, um, a type of joystick or handle that you can uh, grab hold of and then that will be both tracking the movement of the finger or the hand and also generating that uh, that force touch feedback. Uh, there are multiple interfaces as well such as the ones you can see here different examples. Again think of them as more robots that are generating uh, that um, uh, force feedback sensation on the different fingers. Related to, to medicine and surgery, there are various haptic interfaces that have uh, come to the market. These are commercially available. Again, some of them still um, exist and are part of existing commercial simulators from endoscopy, laparoscopic surgery, uh, endovascular interventions. Um, and um, this one here, needle insertion, is no longer produced, but was uh, available a few years ago. Um, force feedback gloves, this is the concept of integrating the um, force feedback, but at the uh, finger level with many points of contact. Um, ideally, it should be lightweight so they can, the, the hand can move around easily and have a large workspace. They do have a number of limitations. Uh, they can be somewhat awkward. Um, the force response is not too fast and, and also the um, up to recently only basic geometry can be um, can be interacted with. Uh, this this table summarizes the latest generation of uh, haptic gloves. Um, this is from 2018, and you can see a number of them. Uh, quite a few of these are still available in the market, and we'll we'll go over a few examples. Others are, are no longer available. Um, the majority do um, interact with all five fingers. 
some of them are wireless, and there's a few other characteristics. There are references there uh, if you want to, to look at it later. So I'll just go through a few of the, of the commercially available uh, haptic gloves. Um, so this is hap haptics, um, and, and you can see they claim to have realistic touch, power force, magnetic uh, motion tracking, and you can get a sense of what it looks like. So quite still quite bulky. Um, all of these really are used through a virtual reality um, interface also with, with a headset, uh, and they have some uh, tracking that will keep um, the location of the hand and the different fingers. Uh, Sense Glove is, is, is slightly different. This is more uh, mechanical. You can see the different components here and, and also uh, able to provide false feedback, some a degree of tactile feedback. Um, and um, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, if you have Tesla, Tesla suit, so they, uh, they will known because they produce this type of whole body haptic uh, suits that provide feedback throughout the different actuators. This is not yet out, but it's, uh, it's coming out um, later this year. So the Tesla suit glove, again, um, not that different from the, from the Sense glove. Um, VR glove is uh, another um, alternative. Uh, again, you can see relatively similar, able to generate a degree of forces wireless and, and of course able to track uh, in detail the motion of the hand and the fingers. Uh, Minus is, is slightly different one. This is really more having specific um, actuators on, on certain parts of the of the glove, uh, but it is wireless and it can be, uh, it's battery powered and it can be, um, it's compatible with a number of different uh, virtual reality headsets. Uh, Gotos VR, this is the last example. Again, this is around specific um, um, actuators that can then be modularly used in the, in the different fingers. Um, moving on to talk about haptics enable simulators. So this is a, a timeline of um, simulators. Um, and what I want to point out here, so this is really particularly relevant around technical skills. Uh, and this, the um, haptic enable simulators, the first one was probably introduced around the mid 90s uh, for arthroscopy. And since then, there's been a number of different uh, simulators making use of haptic technology. Uh, you can see some of them here, um, largely for, for surgery, uh, different surgical specialties. Uh, again, arthroscopy, laparoscopic, uh, dental, there is um, uh, ophthalmology, um, endoscopy, and so on. Now, what about uh, in anesthetics? Um, a, a recent search looking at the um, PubMed um, uh, for haptics uh, simulation uh, related to anesthetics or anesthesiology. Um, you can see this is not that many really, this uh, 21 uh, publications uh, that are relevant since 1997 to 2020. Each of this is one, so in 2020, there's a couple of them. Uh, and then this is a year 2018, there were three of them. So, so not, not, not a lot. Um, I've put here the, uh, the ones that are particularly relevant for, for anesthetics. Uh, the majority of them have to do with uh, a needle puncture, needle uh, interventions so, such as epidural. Um, there is a couple of them. So this is related to ABCDE, so airway management, uh, and this other one as well for a specific virtual reality uh, airway skills training. Uh, just to show, I know this is not perhaps particularly relevant to this um, webinar, but just to illustrate again the concept of haptics, in, in this case for an epidural prototype where you can see this is one of the haptics devices uh, devices that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and the, um, the needle is inserted, engages with the, um, with the haptic device that can then generate the uh, level of resistance and force feedback as, as necessary. Uh, this uh, company, Medic Vision, Australian company, is not, uh, I don't think it exists anymore, but they did have this prototype that came to the market. Um, this is a um, um, European um, project that um, um, finished, I think, a couple of years ago, looking at regional anesthesia. I'm just going to skip this slightly. And you can see, so this is um, uh, ultrasound um, uh, view and then manipulating the, the prof. Um, here on the left, you can see the setup where, again, this is one of these of the shell haptic devices. Uh, let me just fast forward this slightly. Um, so you can go, the simulation goes through the different steps, uh, ultrasound guided and do different checks. So, uh, so 
And, and finally, virtual airway skills training. So this is a vast simulator. Again, this um, it makes use of um, uh, this uh, OPNI uh, phantom device. So this is generating uh, false feedback as uh, and it incorporates both endotracheal intubation as well as cricothyroidotomy uh, in the simulator. You can see that it's uh, fairly basic, but it does incorporate um, a degree of false feedback. Okay, so just a few thoughts to conclude and, uh, and, um, and mention uh, some possible uh, directions going forward as, as we've seen um, relatively quickly because of, of time, but, but haptics is a technology that uh, is reasonably well established um, and, and touch is a crucial sense in simulation. Um, haptics technology continues to arise now this is to a large extent due to the big push in virtual reality and, uh, and virtual reality without touch it doesn't have the same value therefore uh, various different uh, startup companies various different um, uh, large companies and research institutions are looking at how to incorporate touch in virtual reality um, there are quite um, still quite substantial technological not just technological but also economic wearability challenges uh, we saw some of the haptic gloves, they are uh, to some extent technologically advanced, but they still tend to be bulky and, and not perhaps not, not particularly ergonomic. Um, it's, it's actually important to combine tactile and force feedback. Again, some of those uh, gloves, some of those um, haptic interfaces begin to incorporate tactile feedback as well, um, but is, is not yet as um, perhaps as required in the case of um, uh, anesthetic uh, simulation, particularly for non-needle-based um, um, uh, interventions or, or procedures. Um, however, mixed reality using so-called visual haptic. So Teddy show an example where there is a 3D printed model um, that can be relatively easily combined with augmented reality to form the so-called mixed reality where there is a physical interaction um, uh, enhanced by, uh, by the augmented visualization. In terms of the future in, in aesthetics, I would venture that um, we, we do need to move beyond the epidurals, the real anesthetics, and, and perhaps explore more increased airway simulation. The, um, the technology is there to begin to experiment, uh, begin to explore these, these new approaches, and, and I believe that uh, they will uh, definitely have um, a potential, they have potential for, for exploring the use in airway simulation. But I'd like to conclude by just highlighting the fact that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we do need to be very clear about what are the intended outcomes, the intended learning outcomes, what are the, the, the educational goals. It's, it's not about the technology, it's about the, the customer experience, or in this case, about the uh, resident, uh, the medical student, the training experience. Thank you very much. And, and please do feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the email there. Thank you, Prof. Bello, for your talk. We have come to the end of the webinar. We hope that you have enjoyed the talks and now very curious to try out virtual reality airway games. So before we start the Q&A session, I want to share with you the audience some virtual reality airway gaming resources that you can download from the App Store for, and play for free. So you just have to go to the App Store um, and look for either Airway X, which is a fiber optic uh, game that you can play on your phone, or you can search for the AARC or you could go to the URL that Mr. Ronald Naninga had shared with you earlier on and have a, have a go at the free level of the ABCD eSIM. So now we will um, carry on with the Q&A session. I'd like to thank the panelists for uh, the excellent talk. So some of the questions that have come through is, uh, are uh, when it comes to simulation or any of these models, uh, what is the feedback that you get when it's something which is very low fidelity, which is something very basic? Do the trainees feel that there's nothing much gained, uh, gained from it? And 
based on the feedback, what how can this low fidelity models or uh, low fidelity uh, simulations, how can they be improved? Maybe Dr. Teddy, since he's, uh, he has uh, yeah. a model that he has created. Yeah, hi. Um, okay, I think if I understand the question, is a question whether the low fidelity, how, what's the impact of yes. uh, low fidelity to our trainings? I think yes. uh, for any low fidelity exercise or any, uh, any simulation, with, even if it's low or high fidelity, the most important part is the learning objectives and the creative creativity that goes behind, uh, behind it. So uh, for us, right, uh, uh, one example is that the one I showed earlier on regarding wherein we use uh, low fidelity, um, uh, low cost uh, uh, lung model that we use for bronchoscopy. We're in, we use it for one lung ventilation exercise for our residents. Based from our um, uh, residents' feedback, they actually quite like it because one, it, uh, it, it serves the purpose of learning the maneuvers and proper handling of the bronchos bronchoscope. Then at the same time, it gives them a rough idea of what the basic steps on how to use bronchial blockers for pediatric patients. So going back to the question, how what's the impact of low fidelity? I think the impact of low fidelity depends deeply on how creatively you crafted your learning objectives and how you managed to find your way towards that endpoint using, even if you're using a low fidelity equipment. Of course, uh, like uh, other, other speakers have mentioned, right? As much as possible, you want your simulators as close to reality as possible. But however, of course, if faced with some finance or resources issue, it is important also to find a way in order to make, meet the means wherein you can have all the, res uh, use up your old resources, set up your learning objectives, and manage to get your way and target the goal. So with that, your learners, your trainees will be able to gain their knowledge. At the same time, they manage to have the touch that uh, Professor Bello uh, highlighted during his talk. We're in there, the patient managed, they can still do the fiber optic, they can still do the maneuvers, they can still do all these uh, uh, steps that they needed to do to, uh, to simulate the actual patient. Perhaps just to add to that in terms of um, feedback and uh, I'm just wondering whether to interpret feedback in terms of feedback to the, um, to the trainee, to the resident. Uh, and I think that um, even with the um, so-called low fidelity um, models, there's still the possibility of giving feedback. So this can be either by video recording and then obviously going through, through that video recording in, in a debriefing session. Um, Potentially as well, it is possible, particularly nowadays with, with again, with technological advances to relatively easily capture um, the, the motion of, for example, of, of, of the hands, uh, the interaction with the model itself. Uh, and then uh, that can be further used to, to quantify and provide some metrics of performance, some, some uh, um, more quantitative uh, objective feedback as well. Thank you, Dr. Teddy and uh, Professor Bello. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, um, we had a, an example in the Netherlands where a, a company created a, a simulation uh, for doing a, a, a colon, colon, just, uh, for uh, training eye hand movement of uh, doctors. And then it, it turned out that uh, for eye hand movement, it was a correct uh, uh, application. And they actually added game aspects like uh, small monsters that you had to catch in, the, in a piping and maze system. But the, the experienced doctors uh, wouldn't use it because they said it's too far away from our re reality. And it, do it doesn't have the, the, the fine uh, detailed response that we have on the real uh, equipment that we use in hospital. So if the learning objective is to train eye hand movement, you might have a lower uh, fidelity model than if you really try to mimic a very complex surgical procedure. I think that's uh, something to add to it. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, so what were the challenges that you faced while creating ABCD SIM? And at, what, at present, uh, which are the professionals or which fields are present uh, using uh, your app? Yeah, well, audio well, program. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we we created uh, the the games uh, with the 
doctors and uh, residents uh, in, in the hospital, and they provided a lot of input in creating the scenarios and also make uh, fine tuning the physiological model. Um, but the point is, uh, when creating software, um, it isn't over until it's finally tested. And, uh, and if you make uh, uh, generic software, you can have anyone test it, uh, software from a, from a technical point of view, but while creating a simulation, you need um, content matter experts to do the testing, which is quite complex because uh, uh, those are not the most people, the most time to actually spend the time going on and on for, for uh, many times on the game to actually see whether everything is working correct. So this is something that's very under uh, under uh, uh, anticipated. So uh, uh, actually making sure that the team stays on board and also there are people around to, to do final testing is something that uh, uh, we learned to, we have to organize uh, beforehand. Uh, and then, uh, but then uh, uh, reaching to the second question, we started the game uh, creating it for residents. Uh, but then later on, we got response from nurses saying, why can't we use this as well? So we created a nurse version. And then uh, it's, uh, we got uh, uh, CME accreditation. So it became also a, a way of uh, 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 collecting your points as an experienced consultant. Um, and it was also used by the uh, health inspection uh, to test whether people actually are appropriate uh, trained to, to perform ABCD procedures. And then later on, we got students saying, well, why can't we play the game, medical students? And the educational people said, well, you can't because you don't have the experience to do so. Uh, uh, but they insisted on doing so because medical students uh, get their knowledge in a different way than when I was at university. We had to read the books and do the exam, but they'd actually go and play and test and fail and start again and find out why they're failing. And actually uh, by that, uh, creating a, 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 an umwelt, a, a, a picture of their an, an environment. Um, and this is something that uh, was very, uh, very funny because it's... Uh, 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 it actually had a much larger, bigger audience, which is also next time we do a, a release uh, will also help us to to big bigger project team when we start also to to address those specific uh, uh, type of experiences in in our game. But we didn't we didn't uh, focus on that beforehand. It, it turned out that people actually enjoyed uh, uh, wanting wanted to use the game as well uh, for their own personal reasons, uh, either to uh, improve the chances of becoming a resident or get a higher grade or at, at school or just to get your uh, accreditation points uh, uh, as uh, part of your uh, CME. Thank you, Mr. There's, there's a question uh, in the Q&A. Does age or generation affect the learning curve through technology? Uh, well, in our case, what we see is that uh, I do uh, sessions with uh, medical staff of different ages, and uh, some of them do all the all the doctors. And I don't, they, some of them are very into uh, technology, and some of them are not into technology. Uh, but what I see at the younger generation, they're very easy to 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 work with the, the technology. But it's ne it's never uh, uh, it will will never stop you. It's uh, um, if, yeah, if you're not experienced using a mouse, you have difficulty using the game. Uh, but uh, then again, most of us are able to use mouses now. So uh, I think it will go away by, by, by time. But what we do when we do a, a, a workshop, I put a younger doctor with an experienced doctor uh, together at one screen. And then the younger doctor actually the, the helps the, the older doctor and together they uh, f uh, figure out uh, how to uh, finish a scenario which is, uh, uh, yeah, working very well. So just, just to add to that, uh, from, um, from our experience, uh, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, there's a generation effect uh, in the learning curve. Uh, however, uh, we need to recognize that the younger generations are much more tech savvy. And, and of course, you know, they, some may already uh, have access to, to the to reality headsets and may already have you know, a range uh, experience with a range of technologies. Um, but I've, I've, I've worked with um, very senior, very experienced uh, consultants across different specialties and, uh, and they very easily embrace technology. I think it's a lot to do with, with uh, personal attitude as well, rather than this early age, really. Yeah, I agree, yeah. I think it's a matter of exposure and diving to the, to the technology. 
Because the moment you say no to it, regardless of what age, there are some who are actually, uh, even if very senior consultants, will actually die to the technology and try to use it. Uh, proper hand-eye coordination is something that you practice, something that you need to be exposed. So the less that you expose, regardless of what age you are, you will not be able to manage or you won't be able to play with the equipments that you wanted to, to master. Uh, Prof, well, uh, when it comes to fiber optic, it's, it's, it's an expensive piece of equipment and a pediatric uh, fiber optic is quite delicate. So do you think at some point a uh, haptic device can replace or maybe even cheaper than uh, us buying a sim uh, something like an OR sim which has a uh, fiber optic? Means if we have a haptic which can be used, a fiber optic it can be used by many specialties. Yeah, if, if you're talking about simulation, certainly, yes, uh, there, there is. Um, the, uh, the ability to create a, a, um, a virtual environment, a virtual visualization that doesn't really even require to have the fiber optics. Uh, all you need to have is just obviously a, um, a, a real uh, flexible tube, shall we say, that, uh, that, that mimics the uh, fiber optics. And then uh, you, you can insert that into a device that will effectively track the movement of the uh, of the um, of the flexible tube, shall we say, and then uh, generate the corresponding feedback. So, so yes, in fact, um, when um, uh, one of the uh, simulators I mentioned earlier, uh, the first prototype we developed, so this was for endoscopy, we use a a hose uh, from you know from a DIY store. That uh, of course, the feedback that we have from the participants from the endoscopies was that it was very rigid, and you know, and, and obviously we needed to modify that. Um, but um, but it just goes to show that you can actually because it's you're simulating as long as you have a degree of of uh, validity in terms of uh, it looks like the real thing it feels like the real thing and then of course the content is suitable then uh, yeah I think you could you could replace it. I think there are some questions on the Q&A uh, by uh, Yao, Wai Chan. Yao Wai Chan. Can more than one person play in the, a, in the ABCDE sim and can instructors provide feedback real time to the participant? Maybe Ronald, you can take the question. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, we do get that question more, uh, but in the current release, only one person can play the game. Um, uh, and, but that feedback is provided afterwards. Uh, to the individual user. Uh, that's also the part of the concept that we started, that it should be a personal, safe environment for someone to practice by themselves. Uh, but we are looking into the concept of actually uh, having multi-user versions. Uh, but uh, in the current release, it is not, not yet supported. There's another question on the chat. Are there concerns related to the loss of emotions um, really failing to insert the endotracheal tube in an extremely emergent situation to a baby, virtual to reality. Um, Teddy, do you want to take that question? I think this is the one example that uh, Professor Bello mentioned any, uh, earlier on, where it is a hybrid of virtual reality and your actual model that you have. So if you have the combination of the two, you will have the feel, you'll have the feedback that you need to have at the same time you have the visual of the actual patient that you make uh, the combination of both is actually a good good plan or good suggestion in order for you to have the the feel of the endotracheal tube going inside the trachea then at the same time you have the visual of the virtual reality so i think that, that combination that the professor belt highlighted earlier on is the best solution to that particular question that they highlighted and, just, and, just to add a comment to that, um, yes. Yeah, so I think that the, the multi-sensory simulation is really crucial, and uh, it's the um, of course the visual the interaction, the, the the sense of touch, but also uh, audio sound as well. Um, I think that 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 is a really really important cue. Uh, we had uh, experience, and um, I don't know if you noticed, but the um, uh, sim the uh, clip that I show the simulation at the back all we had were banners so we we have a, a, an anesthetic machine but actually it is a banner uh, however um, the um there was a real anesthetist and you know all the people are real surgeons um, um, scrub nurses and so on 
uh, and, and when we change this sound, even though the anesthetist knew that it was a banner, immediately he turned around to look at the anesthetic machine. You know, it's just the, uh, the, the reaction, that, that instinct of uh, listening that is something wrong with the, with the sound uh, and immediately turning around to check. So I think that having that uh, multi-sensorial simulation that combines as best as possible uh, um, sound, um, sight, visuals, the uh, haptics, and ideally even smell in some cases, that, that, would be, that would be very good. And if I can add to that, we, uh, in our case, we noticed that when we tested the game, that when it's a, a medical student or a very young resident, uh, they don't actually uh, provide feedback on, on the sound of the, of the monitor. Some of them get annoyed by the sound. We even did a, a research where we do, did eye tracking to see whether they would respond to that part of the screen when an alarm would go off. But the more experienced the user is, the more they are into playing the game and are not willing to stop the scenario unless they actually stabilize the patient. So for them, it's, it's more than a game. It's not that you're halfway, if your time is up, you go have a cup of coffee. No, you finish your scenario. And when the patient is stable, then you go off to do to, to, to do other stuff. And I think actually that's also part of, as uh, Dr. Bello mentioned, the sound feedback and the response of the patient and the real life response of the patient while playing the game. To them, it's uh, even, we have a dummy scenario where as a mannequin, uh, where you can uh, uh, um, exercise. Uh, and first it was a virtual patient, uh, looking like a real patient and they, they insisted that we would change that into a mannequin because they wouldn't test the, their equipment on a real patient. They would test their equipment on a mannequin, which doesn't make any sense if you think of it, but it actually tells them that while they're playing the game, they actually feel they're addressing a real person. And I think that's important to address a real person and haptic feedback and then even make that more lifelike. I think there's a big, big advantage to make there. So, uh, Mr. Can you just tell us a bit more about the gaming initiative in Singapore? Uh, so, is it going to be available? Is, is it for all the trainees? Yeah, we, is it going to be available uh, even for non trainees, like people from other it countries? Is, uh, uh, it's a, a project that's TAP. Um, we are uh, setting up uh, uh, demo environments now. We're doing the first evaluation of games that will be developed in various places, uh, also KKH. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Singapore, and we are trying, we're testing those now, and actually uh, they will be provided through the, for the people in the hospitals uh, through Thing Health. Um, and actually, uh, we are also collecting new IDs uh, uh, to uh, enhance to create more games. And some of them are very complex games, and some of them are very straightforward games. But at, at, at this moment, we're doing the, the field testing uh, uh, with the nurses and uh, re residents. Uh, in the in, in hospital, um, so it's uh, um, yeah, and then uh, when it's when actually it's available on the platform in Singapore, we are also looking uh, to expand uh, uh, to other countries. We're having talks in Malaysia at the moment uh, uh, about uh, using it there as well, making it available to as much people uh, uh, as possible, and also in those areas where uh, uh, there are not uh, the same uh, budgets available that might be available in Europe or in Singapore. So that's an important part of our uh, uh, adventure. Yeah. I think for those who are interested, there is a Serious Games Association. Uh, yeah. Serious Games Asia is the founding member of the Serious Games Association. And for those uh, after today's session who may be interested to find out more, can actually yeah. um, join the association, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, the Serious Games Association. Um, we are also working on validating the, the games and making uh, giving this, uh, them a proof of quality uh, to uh, actually, uh, when you're playing it, you know that it's a valid learning in instrument. Uh, and that's, that's uh, we're also bridging to uh, the Netherlands uh, with the Dutch Society for Simulation of Health. Uh, so we are also implementing uh, uh, quality systems uh, there. Uh, yeah. But if you're interested, actually, yeah, as Dr. Uh, Joe said, uh, uh, yeah, feel free to contact us. Happy to uh, talk to you about it. Yeah, so the Serious Games Association is a not-for-profit 
volunteer-driven uh, transnational society. So please feel free for those who are interested in this area to um, participate. And perhaps you can develop a serious game of your own. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Rebecca has a question uh, in the Q&A. How much do the simple game cost to set up? That is um, a difficult question. And then I always respond to this, how much does a car cost? If you, want to, uh, you can do it, you can have an expensive car or a very cheap car. It all depends on what, what your learning objective is. And if you start small, uh, then with minimal minimal budget, you, you can you, you can start off. And we have projects running in Singapore uh, uh, that are 10,000 Singapore dollar, 20,000. Uh, and we also have uh, much, much, much more expensive uh, uh, projects running. But it's uh, usually making a full, uh, first small step and showing what the idea is actually is a trigger to get additional funding uh, to uh, further uh, create more scenarios to make it a more uh, uh, sustainable solution. And, and just, just to add to that, um, one of the um, um, goals that we have uh, within the, the AMC, so this is um, um, St. Hill Duke and US Academic Medical Center is to, um, to, to build that uh, capacity and capability to develop internally the uh, simulations, the serious games, uh, which means in this case that um, if there is a resource, the expertise to do it and to support the, um, the, the clinicians themselves to do it, then it becomes uh, quite affordable if you look across the, uh, the system. I think that's, that's one of the ideas of the, of the TAP initiative, I understand correctly, yeah, exactly. to provide a platform that can then uh, be used for, for uh, developing for sort of as, as, as a market. So imagine as a type, type, uh, type of uh, app store for serious games, if, again, if I understand correctly. Um, so yeah. the cost can actually be, again, yes, it's, it's you know, the, the cars, the cost can vary substantially, but but at least to get, get a proof of concept, uh, get a feasibility study going, um, I think that can be quite uh, economical. Yeah, and we will, we are, to add to that, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bello. Uh, we are working with students from SUTD uh, from a technical point and also uh, with other, other technical students. And we also have a collaboration with Drexel University in, in the US, is that their gaming studio. So putting together uh, uh, student pools to create uh, the in, in initial versions. Uh, but then, of course, it's important to have the content matter experts on board as well. So you, I need the people in the audience actually to, to come up with the right ideas and the right knowledge on this. Uh, I think Linda has a comment on the Q&A uh, for the, I think it's addressed to Mr. Ronald. For a new account registration for the virtual med school ABCDE SIM game, will we need a predefined code? Um, yeah, if you fill in the form that on, uh, based on the URL that I just sent you, you will get a registration code. And if it's a registration code, you can uh, create an account in our system. So uh, uh, it's, it's a mostly automated process. So uh, um, yeah. I think we are almost at the end of the Q&A yeah. session. Yeah, uh, and I think we don't have any more questions which uh, need to be answered. So the, the, all the unanswered questions uh, we will be answered by our panelists at a later point. Uh, this, uh, it can be emailed to you. So uh, we've come to the end of the Q&A session. We hope that you have enjoyed the session. Uh, let us thank our speakers and audience who have made this webinar a success. And do mark your calendar for the 15th of November for the fifth ASPA Flex webinar on pediatric sedation. Before I say bye to everybody, I would just like to go back to this slide. Some people may have missed um, uh, taking note 
of the free airway virtual uh, virtual reality airway resources. So I will leave this slide on uh, for those who may want to take note. Uh, for those uh, who have enjoyed and uh, have other plans for the evening, we thank you for attending and bye-bye.